Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode 28 of Wake Up Call. We are continuing the theme of urbanism that's been popping up on our podcast lately. And today we have someone with a little bit more expertise and experience than us in the field um, to help us learn more. Our guest today is Professor Pierre Fillon, Professor Emeritus of the University of Waterloo here in Canada. His specialty is in urbanism and urban planning, specifically in the field of downtown and inner city planning. Welcome to the show, Professor uh, Fillon. Uh, is there anything I missed there? Oh, you covered a lot. I covered well, a lot. I did my I, research. I, I, well, an, another area of interest in my research is metropolitan scale planning. Got it. So I, I went from the big scale, the metropolitan region as a whole, to specific areas like downtowns and inner cities and neighborhoods. Right. Okay. That's good to know. So I, I you know, that's I think that's a great point to start off. And we just like you to, to describe what your field of research is. What is the discipline of urban studies of urban planning specifically? Yeah. Um, it's it's a bit difficult to define. And it is interesting because um, when I was teaching, very often I would have students who would show up at the master's level and said, well, if I would have known that such a field existed before, I would have done it as an undergraduate. So a lot of people don't really know what Durban said. They know that there are cities, but they don't necessarily know that there are professions and disciplines that are focused on the planning of cities, the development of cities, and the operation of cities. Um, in, in my case, uh, I was always, I, I liked to draw maps when I was a child, a little child. I would draw maps of cities all the time, but I didn't know, like I was saying, I didn't know that such a field existed. I thought it was kind of just a hobby or something that I was doing like that. And it happened that at some point I saw a documentary on cities with Lewis Mumford. Lewis Mumford is one of the great urbanism from mid, mid century urbanism, wrote a lot about cities and had his own vision of cities at a time when a bit like Jane Jacobs, another great urbanism, uh, ur urbanist of the 20th century. But their views was quite similar in the sense that they thought that the way cities were planned in the 20th century was wrong. And they thought that there were some prince, there were some principles inherent in cities that existed before that were much better than what urbanists were doing in the 20th century. And this is the point he was making. So as, as a child, I saw a national film board, which is the Canadian documentary and film agency, black and white on television, you know, dating from the fifties with Louis Mumford who was describing cities and what worked and what didn't work in cities. And I remember that one of those cities was Amsterdam. And he was saying how great it was and how human scale it was and how pleasant it was and walkable as well. So all of that came into the picture. And, and he was uh, implicitly comparing that to the kind of suburbs that were developing in North America at the time or urban renewal that was going on in North America at the time that for him didn't make any sense. So that was the first time that I discovered that actually people were writing about these kind of things and are interested in these kind of things. And just, I, I just follow through that. One thing I like, I did one of my degree was in political science and people were studying with me were studying. Well, Canada, it's always about federal provincial relations and that sort of thing. So there were a lot in, involved a lot in that. And they were also involved a lot in international relations. So th those were the prestigious areas of political science. In my case, I thought urban politics was so much more interesting because it was tangible. You can see it. You know, it's right in front of you. And there's another element as well, is that it is very difficult when you're doing international relations to get an interview with Putin or someone else. But you can always get an interview with your counselor or someone involved in urban development. So that was another major advantage. So, um, okay, to come back to urban studies, urban studies I would see as divided in, diff in different sectors. Uh, you've got one sector, which is planning. 
And planning is about, you know, how to develop cities for the future, how to decide what's being built, what's not being built. There's another aspect as well, and and planners should work more with them, which is civil engineering. Civil engineering has a lot to do with cities, and and they tend to dominate the field of transportation. And that obviously causes sparks, because planners tend to control the field of land use planning, and then you've got the engineers who control the field of transportation, and that doesn't always work together. You know, they don't always work together very well in that respect. And then you've got areas like urban design and architecture that have a major urban aspect as well. In a way, it is quite difficult to define cities because, you know, what a city is, because I would argue that cities are probably the most complex human realization. Of all the things that humans have created, cities, and I would argue probably language as well, are probably the two most, you know, important, the two most complex things. And they're probably the two most complex to understand as well. And they're the ones that have the most variations. And, uh, and both of them as well have kind of a self-propelling aspect to them. You know, they have their own evolution that takes place that is often very difficult to predict. And uh, and it is certainly impossible to control by any one agency. I know in French, um, the Académie Française tries to, con- to control, you know, what's happening in the French language, but it just doesn't work. <laughs> you know, I remember the le COVID versus la COVID big debate that was happening. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So you, you you can't really, it's it's usage that determines a language. You can't really control it. So it is a bit the same with cities. You can control aspects of cities. Yeah, but in the long term, no, it's too complex. There's not one single agency that will be able to control urban development. It's really nice to hear that you've been interested in this field since you were uh, a child, essentially. Uh, so it's really nice. And also, I myself study international relations. Well, and I'm I study... sorry about what I said about international <laughs> relations. No, I think that you made a wonderful link between our urban studies and how urbanists as like public officers essentially um, are really important to have that relationship with them and politicians and get insights from one another. And I also study in The Hague, which is really close to Amsterdam, has a lot of similarities. So uh, I think that there's definitely links in there. So you talked about the importance of cities and how sort of they evolve over time by themselves, which is really interesting. Could you expand um, about your opinion on the importance of cities to the world and how they have transformed the way that we live. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll go back to Mumford. You know, Mumford, Ma- Lewis Mumford used to say that cities were the hub of culture. And culture comes from human interaction and where you've got the most human interactions and in c- it's in cities. So this is where culture evolves from. And, and he would have said um, that you know, the civilizations that were the most advanced, and that's very colonialists in this perspective, and it wouldn't be acceptable nowadays, but there must, there may still be something to it, are civilizations that had cities because they're the ones that were able to generate that kind of interaction. Of course, writing help and, and building out of stone and brick rather than out of wood helped as well because we have preciously little left of civilizations that built out of wood. But, you know, we've got all the Roman ruins and the Greek ruins and the Egyptian pyramids and all these sorts of things, because those people built, you know, out of uh, lasting material. But, you know, that that was his perception. And I, and, and I think that still applies. You know, when, when you look at where a lot of creation happens, it's a lot in cities that a lot of the human creation happens and it is related to that and innovations as well. Innovations happen in cities. There's a big, there's a big flurry of writings at the moment about how important cities are and the argument that, that they are mostly important because of that innovation potential that is inherent in urban areas. But then, you know, it can work in the other direction as well. You know, you can, you can reach a point where instead of having economies of scale, 
related to urban development, you start having these economies of scale related to urban development as well. When it becomes really difficult to circulate in a city because there's too many people, where living in a city becomes so expensive that a lot of creative people can't afford to live in the cities anymore. Well, the cities lose that potential that they have for creativity. So cities have that potential, but there are dangers that that potential may not be fulfilled. Okay, so I'm I'm born and raised in Winnipeg, and I go to school in Montreal, and the difference between those two cities, in my opinion, could not be more stark. In Winnipeg, my lifestyle revolves on taking my car everywhere. I can't really bike or walk anywhere versus in Montreal. That's that's all I do. I I have never driven a car in Montreal. None of my friends own cars. They all find it easy to just bike and walk and take the metro and transit. And this difference is not only within the satellite areas of the of the city, but especially within the downtowns. Downtown Winnipeg is, you know, dense in the sense that it has a lot of buildings around. It has sidewalks. It's walkable. But there aren't people walking around. There aren't people sitting on a pat- patio enjoying a, a beer like you might see in Montreal. So my question for you is, what makes a city so conducive, like Montreal, so conducive to this sort of life downtown? The fact that people actually live there and hang out downtown versus in Winnipeg, where downtown is mainly a business district where people get in their cars and drive home from after they're done work. Some cities are able to develop an urban living culture. Some other cities, for some other cities, it is more difficult to achieve that. Um, in Montreal, it may be a cultural thing. Uh, it may be related. I, I, I always found that Montreal is the most magnificent as a city the first day of spring. You know, that first day when it's warm, where you don't have to wear a coat. And then you're walking you know, in Montreal, like, oh, it's incredible. Everyone's smiling and everyone's happy. And you start having that outdoor life. So so you've got that pent up, you know, desire to be in the city, to be outside, to interact outside. And, and, and all of that, that happens. You would think that the same thing would happen in Winnipeg. But, but somehow Winnipeg hasn't developed that kind of urban, that urban culture. You know, that urban, and, and the urban environment that goes with that ur- urban culture. I think in Montreal, what helps a lot is all those terrace kind of places, you know, where people can just eat and drink outside and all of that. And that is very conducive to that form of urban living. But M- 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 Montreal is an interesting case. It has a dance inner city, partly because of the triplex configuration, you know, the three-story housing, you know, with the outside stairs, you know, that goes on. And that configuration is very conducive to that kind of living. When you go to the plateau, you know, and and even further out, you know, in the old small where you've got Masso and all that, it it has developed a lot of that activity, that street-oriented kind of activity. But when you hit the suburbs, you lose all of that. Okay, so and in the suburbs, Montreal is probably one of the most American-like city in Canada. It is much less dense in its outer suburbs than Toronto is, than Vancouver is. Maybe not Winnipeg. I I, I don't know. But but in that respect, you know, it loses that dimension. But still, people in the suburbs come to the center of the city to enjoy that kind of living. So th- so there is that positive element to it. And and I think it has to do with transit plays an important role in that respect. Because when people use transit, it means that they have to walk a distance to go where they need to go. And, th- and then it becomes an inducement to walkability. And, and, uh, Downtown Montreal is a walkable area in the sense that not only are distances not too long, you can walk from one place to the other, but it is also a stimulating and an entertaining environment. When you walk, there's a lot of things to see all the time because there's a lot of other people who walk, so it's nice to look at the people who are walking and so on. People eating or drinking outside, that's nice to see. Store windows, that's interesting to see. And the architecture is adapted to that walkability dimension in the central part of Montreal. So 
I think that plays in its favor. There's also different periods of development that were preserved. So you go from old Montreal and then you go to the really modernist uh, downtown and then you've got other areas that are more residential, high density residential, and you've got all of that kind of combined. So when you're walking in the downtown area, it is you you do have that entertainment due to the diversity of the area. That's really interesting. And we do see how it's so important to have our cities be walkable. But could you expand a bit more on the theoretical aspect? Like, how, when does a city actually become walkable? Is there some sort of threshold that has to be passed? Um, or is it more just a, by the looks of it? Historically, all cities were walkable because that was the only mean of transportation. So when you go to older cities, they, they're all walkable. You know, if they've been well preserved, they're all walkable. That was lost when there was a shift towards car driving. And then everything was adapted to the car. And then the cities became certainly not walkable. And, and, and more than that is that environments became hostile to pedestrians. Uh, in the urban area where I live, Waterloo region, uh, there's very small proportion that is walkable. All the rest are kind of strip commercial areas with drive throughs which are awful. You know, drive throughs are awful for pedestrians because people just got their coffee. They just want to get driving. They don't see the pedestrian who's walking on the sidewalk and they're dangerous. You know, so, so you've got that kind of environment that makes it absolutely non-walkable. So let's go back now to the historical aspect. So, the areas that have maintained their historical land structure have a much greater chance to be still walkable and to be pleasant to walk in and to attract people. And the thing with walkability as well is that the more people walk, the more people will be attracted there to walk. Okay. So, 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 so it's a kind of virtuous cycle that is set into motion. Um, so you got that. But um, there's also some modern areas and cities that have tried to be walkable. Um, you've got examples are the underground cities of Montreal and Toronto, for instance, or the 15 plus in Calgary and uh, Minneapolis, you know, are examples of that. So they're, they're kind of creations of environments that are supposed to be walkable. No, oh, another more obvious example is was a shopping mall. Once you're inside the shopping mall, it's a perfectly walkable environment. I mean, it's entertaining, nice. It's a bit over control, but you know, it's, 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 it's not bad, you know, in terms of a walkable environment. So it is possible to create walkable areas, but the difficulty then is the fragmentation. It's the, it's, it's a problem of urban fragmentation. When you create a modern walkable environment, you can do it at the scale of a few blocks. Or if it's indoor, you know, shopping mall, something like that. But then because the main mode of access to most of those areas is by car, at some point you're going to hit the wide arterial road, parking lots, all of that, and then it ceases to be walkable. Whereas in a traditional urban kind of environment, it is possible to have ongoing walkability and much more diversity in terms of the walkable environment. Because also in the modern versions of walkability, let's say you go in a suburb and there's a creation of a suburban center that is made walkable. All that will be fine, will be walkable and so on, but it will be very standardized, first of all. It's going to be all buildings from the same period. So it's going to be very standard, uh, maybe owned by the same developer, in fact. So it will be very standardized that respect, but also it will be fragmented. It will be relatively small and it won't be connected to surrounding areas. Okay. So that, that, that becomes a difficulty that it's difficult to deal with because it means that people are going to drive to be able to walk in the given place. Whereas in a traditional urban environment, People are going to walk to go to where they want to go. And then, you know, they walk even further. Um, examples of what I'm saying are, are probably the new urbanism examples. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll define new urbanism. New urbanism appeared in the late eighties, 
early 1990s. And the idea of new urbanism was to create an urban environment that would be walkable, that would replicate the traditional small town of the pre-World War II period in the United States or Canada, you know, North, North, North America, with white picket fences and so on. And it would be walkable. So it's a Norman Rockwell kind of environment. Okay, harks back to the past values of North America and so on. But it was meant to be walkable. So what happened? So these places were built. And they used the vernacular kind of architecture. They were really beautiful. They were great to walk in them. But people walk for recreational purposes and health purposes and dog walking purposes. Okay, so that was essentially the reasons why people walk. They did not walk for functional purposes because originally, in the original concept, these developments were meant to have a main street, like the towns, you know, of that period. But they were effectively suburbs. So what happened to the main street? Well, no one was really, you may have had one convenience store and maybe a dentist or something like that. But that was about the extent of it. Because people use their car to go to the big shopping malls and to big, to the Walmart, the big box stores and so on. So that concept did not work because they were not able to generate the economies of scale. So you had that little island of walkability and it was pleasant and so on, but you had nowhere to go. So people did walk more. They'd get to know more. And, you know, and that came up with, with, and, and the surveys of people living there, they knew each other more than elsewhere because they walked, they said hello and so on. They knew each other's dogs and, you know, all, all, all that kind of things. But they didn't go beyond that. It wasn't able to achieve it because it wasn't able to operate at the scale where people would have been able to walk from their home to go to their local destinations. And the reason for that is car dependence may remain. And also those areas were not dense enough to provide walk a, bit, a walkable environment. I think myself the most walkable environments, um, at least the ones that come to mind, are from Paris and New York. And and there's a reason for that. And when I talk, when I say New York, I mean uh, the very dense parts of New York, you know, Manhattan and and some part of Brooklyn, you know, that that that, that kind of New York. And the reason for that is that they're two extremely dense urban areas. So that means that it is possible in those circumstances to find everything you need within a walkable distance because there's enough people there to provide all those services. And this is where the concept of the 15-minute city comes from. You know, 15-minute city is a 15-minute walkable city, and it is, and it was first developed in Paris. And the reason why it was developed in Paris is because Paris is already very close to being a 15-minute city. You know, it's really pretty much in every neighborhood in Paris. You can find pretty much every, every, everything you need. So that was it. Me, me, meanwhile, in in the North American context, in the North American suburban context, it's nearly impossible to provide that. And it was interesting because um, a colleague of mine was having a consulting contract in the suburb of Toronto. And was trying to introduce the 15-minute city concept to people living in that suburban area. And everyone was convinced that what she meant was a 15-minute driving concept. You know, it's a 15-minute driving city. Oh, yeah, we can do that, sir. 15-minute <laughs> driving. We can provide everything people need within that. Sure, we can do that. But walking, you can't the density is not necessary. Thank you for that broad answer. Um well, we recently experienced a historical event, COVID-19, which obviously really impacted how people move around and how much they can leave their house. And you've done some research on this, I believe, uh, about reflections after the pandemic and urban inequalities. Could you perhaps share some of the most interesting findings you've discovered or some facts that really struck you? Yeah. Um, the... Yeah, what struck me the most now, you know, with some hindsight, is how much people's thinking is influenced by the immediate context in which they're living. During the pandemic, there was that feeling that there would be many urban changes that would be long-lasting, that would go on forever. 
and um, and some of those was closing streets to car circulation, having more areas for pedestrians. And it and and you know there was an evolution within the pandemic, and it was especially interesting from the moment, and and it was a side effect of the George Floyd protests. You know, when there was all those George Floyd protests in the U.S., you know, the height of the pandemic, people thought it's going to be, this is a super spreader event, but but it wasn't because it was outdoors. And then people realized that when there were outdoors activities, there was hardly any contagion at all that happened. So all of a sudden, everything started happening outdoors, and it it was wonderful to see that. You know, you had all those patios, cafes, terrace, and all that, and, and, you know, all those activities organized outdoors. And we thought, okay, well, this is going to be a change of urban living. I mean, people are going to start, you know, walking more, doing outdoor things and so on. And then, uh, unfortunately, a lot of the things returned to the normal, which <laughs> it, 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 it wasn't necessarily happy normal, but to the way, to the way things were before. And, and I think that was very unfortunate. Uh, transit was deeply affected by the pandemic for obvious reasons because there you're indoor and you're packed and the ventilation is often not very good in public transit either so in, ter- in, in terms of potential for contagion it it it, it was very 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 high and in many places it hasn't recovered and the main change is the possibility of working from home and people preferring working from from home and re- realizing that you know they're just as productive and if not more because they 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 don't have to commute and that is now having a major impact on some downtown areas you know most notably san francisco you know it 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 it, it is in places where uh people are most apt to work from home so it, it doesn't apply to all the professions but certainly if you're working in high tech, yeah, you can work from home pretty easily. If you're a lawyer, you can do your case research and so on from home as well. That's, but you still need to meet your clients, but you can do a lot of the work at home. And if you're in the financial, you, you know, if you're working in the financial district, well, chances are that you can also do a lot of your work from home because you're just looking at calculations and, and stuff like that. So the cities where employment it's very specialized in those areas like New York, especially Midtown and downtown, San Francisco, were very seriously hit by that. And it's still visible in the downtown. I was just going to say it also it also reflects in in the prices of office buildings in those areas. I was looking, you know, I'm an economic student. I was looking at um, real estate markets and commercial real estate is down, down, down in the past uh, two years because companies are realizing you know, are we really going to pay this much for an office when we could shift most of our work remote and have, you know, much smaller operations in person? Yeah, up up to the point that some people are concerned about this being the possible cause of a crash yeah. and, 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 and a recession because the uh, downtown real estate class A buildings was considered as being the safest investment. I mean, you know, right. it, it, it was like investing in infrastructure. I mean, it's, 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 yeah, it's like a boring yeah. thing that your grandpa invests yeah. in or something like and, that, yeah, just yeah, yeah, from exactly. a pension fund or something. Yeah, and and if that crashes, well, you know, it's going to have a lot of impact on the economy, and and I think as well the full effect hasn't been felt yet because you know leases are different durations. So, you know, every year there's only a small proportion of the companies that need to renew their lease. But, you know, within a five year period, if the current trends hold, yeah, there's likely to be a major difference. And, and from a planning perspective, it becomes really interesting to see, to try to figure out how are we going to change the purpose of those buildings? How are we going to change their use? And, and there's been quite a bit of research done on that. It is relatively easy to change the use of the older office buildings. I'd say the ones built before, you know, the, the mid 1960s, before the big modernist ones, because the floor plates are smaller and then it is possible to put apartments in them or to put other land uses. But when you look at the very, at the modern, you know, high rise skyscrapers with very large floor plates, then it gets complicated because if you start creating apartments and then they won't have windows. 
So, so some people say, well, yeah, well, you can dig an atrium in the middle and, you know, that have sunlight going through. But, you know, if it's a 70 story building, there won't be much light left, you know, if you're at the bottom of that building. So that kind of strategy only works so much. And it would be very expensive to do so as well. So that will be a challenge facing uh, many downtown areas. And it was interesting, you were talking about Montreal, you know, downtown Montreal before. Montreal is one of the cities that is hit quite a bit by that, yeah. you know, that that the number of people working downtown has gone down quite significantly. And, uh, and you know, they're looking for ways of uh, bringing other activities downtowns and, you know, trying to replace that downtown. But it, yeah. it, it, won't, it, won't, it won't be easy. On the other hand, though, it means that people, there will be more activity in residential areas because people right. are going to spend more time there and then they'll start going to the restaurant there. They'll start, you know, spending time, having their meetings there possibly as well. So, so, so it will change the equilibrium of activities within the urban area, within urban areas. Yeah, and it's interesting that you brought up the the office buildings being repurposed for residential reasons and and the difficulties that come with that because. The next point that we want to speak about was was the housing crisis. Um, the rents in in major cities, you know, in the UK, in Canada, the Netherlands are just astronomical these days. And I was I was going to suggest, you know, maybe there's some sort of way that we can um, retrofit office building vacant office buildings, but that seems like it's much more difficult than originally anticipated uh, by me. But what are some what are some um, ways that urban planners are looking to address the cost of living crisis. Yeah. Um, urban planners are blamed for what is happening by politicians. The way I see it is that they're not the culprit, but at the same time, they're not the solution either to the problem. Okay. So, so it's, I'll, I'll, I'll first look at the first part of my statement. Um, in Ontario, at the moment, the Doug Ford conservative government is blaming the, the planners as well. You know, the reason why, you know, it's a housing crisis is because of the green belt, you know, that was brought on by planners. It, it, it is also all the NIMBY movements in neighborhoods, you know, that don't want to have intensification of their neighborhoods. Now, all of that, which, yeah, it, it may have an effect, but it's certainly not the main effect. The main reason is that uh, speculation is too high. So the fact that uh, land has become enormously expensive and it's, and it's, and the reason, okay, one could blame the planners for that because they say, well, well, yeah, that that's because you don't zone enough land for residential development. This is why the cost of existing land is so high. I don't think that is the main problem. The main problem is the surface land. Service plus accessible land is very expensive. It is not a matter of whether it's zoned residential or not. That can be changed fairly easily. But within the areas, the perimeter, per, perimeter of an urban area, what is accessible to the urban, to the center of that urban area or to different parts of that urban area, that amount of land is by nature limited. Because of the infrastructures. I mean, you could create, you know, metro lines going in all directions and so on, but it's a bit too expensive and people don't do that. You know, governments don't do that. So as a result, that amount of land is limited. And as a result, the value as the city is growing is increasing, is increasing all the time. And it becomes ridiculously expensive as it is now beyond the means of what people can afford. Now, how do you deal with that part of the problem? Well, it's complicated. I mean, you could put in new infrastructure. Somehow, I, I don't think anyone has come up. Yes, someone has come up with that idea. I was going to say no one has come up with that idea, but Trump has come up with that idea. Creating new cities, new towns. Okay, yeah, he did come. He's got that idea for 10 or 15 new towns. New towns. But I, I, I think, there, there is something to that. I probably don't see it. I didn't look into details into what he proposed. I don't think he looked into details into what he proposed himself. <laughs> but, but, but I, I think there's something to that. If it were possible to buy land, to create a plan 
urban area that is walkable, where people don't have to buy two, three cars per household. You know, you can walk to most destinations and you've got really good transit access to the main city. I think that could be a way of reducing land, the land costs because if there were enough of them, then you increase supply. And if you increase supply, you kind of reduce the costs because the, 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 the you would know that there's, there's a equilibrium between supply and demand that, that takes place. So I think that could be one way of dealing with it. Is it going to happen? I don't think so. It's happened in the past. I mean, you know, there's the UK examples of that. Uh, there's, France has done it. I, I, I think Holland has done it as well. To some extent. So, so, you know, there were in North America a bit too. So there were examples of new town planning. Um, in a way that, you know, you had those new areas that were in the country, but they were very well connected to the major urban centers. So that could be a possible solution. Now, the other problem is construction costs. And construction costs has just shot through the roof. Um, it got, it worsened during the pandemic because of supply lines. So it was a supply chain. So there wasn't enough supply of material. So that meant, you know, that construction became far more expensive. I think also there, there is an issue as to labor force. You know, we're in a situation where there's not enough labor force at the moment and there's not enough labor force in the construction field. So if there's not enough labor force, construction costs are going to go up. Um, uh, I, I remember when my son, you know, that's a while back, gra- graduated from high school. You know, I went to his graduation ceremony. And it was a, an inner city high school. And, you know, people were all seeing where they were going. And about 60, 65, maybe 70% of them were going to university. There was a very small number going into the trades. So, I, I, I think there is something there. There's not enough people making things and there's not enough people building things around and there's not, not enough people with the skills for doing that. And I think this is one factor that accounts for higher construction costs. Another thing as well that, that plays in, into that is that there hasn't been much in terms of productivity improvements in the construction industry over the last decades. So, and when, when you look at the economy as a whole, you know, overall, you've had an enormous amount of productive, productivity increases, you know, for all the outsourced goods that we're getting. You know, enormous. You look at the cost of a computer. You know, I, I, I remember some, someone used to say that, um, it used to be the case that the most expensive item in an office was a computer. No, it's a chair. Okay. So it's, it's just changed because the computer is important. Well, mind you, the chair is probably important as well. But anyways, <laughs> my, my argument probably doesn't work all that much. But anyways, the, 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 the computer is important and, you know, phones and so on, all of that, you know, the prices go down in real terms over time. Yeah. But meanwhile, things that are produced here, you know, like construction, the prices aren't going down. They're going up. So you get that incredible discrepancy that takes place that explains in large part why housing has become so unaffordable. Now, the solution to the problem would be to build more housing. And in a pure, simple economics interpretation, this is indeed, you know, the, 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 the way to deal with the problem. But if, if the cost of construction is so high, the housing is going to be very expensive. And who's going to be able to to afford it? So that's I I I I I I think that's the problem we're facing at the moment. I'm sorry I don't have any clear solutions apart from that Newtown one, but I don't think the Newtown one is realistic because I don't think any of the governments would be interested in going into the level of intervention and the level of planning that would be required to achieve that. So it it may it may not I don't. Well, nonetheless, you have some brilliant ideas. And for our last question, we uh, wanted 
you to sort of imagine a scenario in which you have all of the political capital to implement whatever you want in a city that you know well, for example. What are the three key things as an urban planner that you'd recommend to decision makers to implement if you had all of the political will, all of the resources to do it? Well, that's good. Um, okay, let's, first I'm going to choose my city. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll choose the big city I'm most familiar with, which is Toronto. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm the big enlightened, uh, ruler, philosopher king, philosopher king, or something like that, or just basically fascist planner. So, you know, I can do whatever I want and all that. Okay. So, uh, what I would do would be to, seriously limit the use of the car but at the same time i would provide good public transit okay like excellent public transit 24 hours a day and you know very good quality public transit i would create large zones of walkable environments i would also uh allow the densification of suburbs, but in a way that respects the suburban kind of environment. Okay, so to, so to just kind of building houses in between existing houses and, and, and things like that, not necessarily building big towers, things like that, but at the same time, there would be other environments where it would be higher density, um, high-rise building, possibly, but all of that very well connected to the center city. Um, ultimately, you know, when you think about it, what planners try to achieve is to make the city work efficiently so people don't have to face, you know, uh, they don't, they don't need to have, you know, their life very difficult to organize. They don't need to, be stuck in traffic. They don't need to be basically have to make detours to get to go to their destinations. They try to make the make life as easy as possible for people. They're trying to create healthy environments. So you want to reduce, you know, pollution and and you want to prevent, especially in the current with the current summer there, you're trying to prevent heat islands and things like that in cities, bringing as much green space as possible in cities. And I would say probably the most important objective that planners should pursue is just to make people happy. You know, to make it so that people can be happy in that environment. I, I, I know when, when I travel, my, I, I keep on looking at cities. I visit, you know, I visit the metro systems while other people are visiting, you know, the tourist sites. I'm in the metro system to see how it operates and, you know, these, <laughs> these sorts of things, but. What I really look at is, are people happy here? You know, are they completely stressed? Or, you know, do they look happy? Do they seem to enjoy life? And so on. So this is what I would try to create in the Toronto environment. It's a tall order because there were a lot of major planning mistakes made in Toronto especially over the suburbanization period. So Toronto, although more dense than most North American cities, it still has too little density to be able to operate as a real transit metropolis and as a real walking metropolis as well. But I would try to move in that direction. It's a very positive note to end on. And I would say that if you are our authoritarian overlord, I think that your concern for our happiness as city dwellers is something that we'd find reassuring. Yeah, but it sounds a bit Brave New World kind of thing. It does sound, it does sound <laughs> a bit <laughs> Brave New World. <laughs> Professor Fillon, thank you so much for your time um, and sharing your expertise. Uh, we really appreciate it. Thank you. It's been a pleasure to talk with you. And as, as you probably were able to realize, it's my favorite topic of conversation. So yeah, your, your passion definitely uh, seeped through. And I'm, I'm, I'm glad that we were able to offer a platform for that. And I'm sure our listeners will appreciate it as well. Thank, thank you, you very much. 
Thanks. All right, everyone. That wraps up episode 28 of Wake Up Call. As always, make sure to follow us on Instagram at Wake Up Call Podcast with underscores in between and on TikTok at Wake Up Call Podcast. We will be back with you very soon. I hope you enjoyed that episode. Bye.